Hello everyone and thank you for joining us in this which is the second of our webinars for 2014 and the first of the year that discusses Limit State Ring, our masonry art analysis software. My name is Tom Pritchard, I'm the host for today's event and I'll be introducing the webinar and also rounding up at the end. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Modelling Railway Bridges Using Limit State Ring and it will discuss how railway loading and common railway bridge features are modelled using Limit State Ring, as well as giving an insight into recent tests carried out in rail load masonry arch bridges. The presentation itself will run until approximately 10 a.m. UK time and will include about 10 minutes at the end for questions, which can be posted by the question functionality that should be present in the webinar interface. We'll try to get around to answer as many of the questions as we can in the time available, but this isn't always possible, and I'm sorry if we're unable to get to yours. For anybody who does have um, questions, and uh, especially those that may require a longer answer, then please feel free to contact us outside the webinar via info at limitstate.com and we'll be more than happy to answer these in detail for you. Our speaker today is Professor Matthew Gilbert, who is the Limit State Ring Product Manager, and I will pass you over to him. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom, and welcome everybody to the, the webinar today. So as Tom's mentioned, the title is Modeling Railway Bridges Using Limit State Ring. In terms of the, the content, I'll start by just saying a few words about uh, Limit State for those who are unfamiliar with the company. Then move on to some background to railway masonry arch bridges and how we can analyze those structures. Then move on to look at railway loading, uh, validation, move on to some examples from the field and then wrap up with some some conclusions and after that there'll be time for for questions as as Tom indicated okay so first of all to say a few words about limit state um, limit state um, span out from a local university here in Sheffield in 2006 basically commercializing academic research and in particular providing engineers with powerful software for ultimate limit state analysis and design. And the approach that we're taking is to use optimization techniques to rapidly and robustly model structures um, and also uh, soil at the ultimate limit state. And so it uses techniques that are not used in, in standard engineering software. Also, um, key focus on ensuring the software is, is robust and validated against uh, numerous uh, tests. And finally, um, as a commercial um, enterprise, um, where we have the resources to fully support the software and clearly it's in our interest to make the software as easy to use as possibly, um, possibly can be. Okay, so just to see where the software fits in in the big picture, those of you who've uh, attended previous uh, limit state seminars will, will be familiar with this. There's basically two types of software on the market. There's traditional automated hand calculation based software. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are advanced tools, for example, based on non any finite elements, discrete elements, and so forth. And there's a large gulf between those two types of tool which we uh, are basically intent on filling using what we call computational limit analysis. So as many of the benefits of traditional methods in terms of speed, ease of use, uh, lack of uh, in-depth uh, expertise into complex numerical methods, but benefits that you can model um, general geometries um, that you can, for example, using uh, fine elements. And we could be talking about uh, soil problems, we could be talking about uh, slab problems, this is going to be our, our next product, Limit State um, Slab. Or we could be talking about masonry arch bridges, which is clearly the, uh, uh, the focus of today's, today's session. In terms of current software, we have the Limit State Ring, which is the first product that we launched back in 2007. Actually, it uh, arose from research carried out in the early 90s, initially funded by 
what was then called British Rail Research, um, who wanted to understand um, what the uh, capacity and margin of safety was for, for their stock of railway bridges. It then got picked up by um, an organisation called Railtrack, uh, who, who, who basically sponsored the release of the very first commercial, sorry, the very first publicly available version. It then got picked up by the International Union of Railways, UIC, which led to the, uh, the development and release of, of Limit State Ring in May 2007. I think it was released at the UIC headquarters in Paris. And now there are a large number of clients uh, across across the world. Limit State Geo was, was launched a year or so later. This uses um, something called discontinuity layout optimization. It basically generalizes the, the method used by Limit State Ring uh, in order to find uh, failure mechanisms in arbitrary uh, geometries of um, form from soil. So it could be, for example, a, a gabion retaining wall, or it could be foundation. And it could actually be a masonry arch bridge. Uh, we actually have been using Limit State Geo quite a lot for doing complex masonry arch bridge analysis, although it's beyond the scope of today's uh, today's session. And again, this software is used widely uh, worldwide. So, in terms of railway masonry arch bridges, some some background. Um, from a local perspective. Um, in the UK, there are tens of thousands of these bridges still in service on the railways. The vast majority of these bridges were built in the, the 19th century or very early part of the 20th century. Um, so we're talking about structures which are almost all more than 100 years old. And we need to uh, check these structures, particularly in the light of um, changing loading regimes, for example. So, question is, how do these bridges work? Well, simplistically, you can um, turn to Robert Hooke's hanging chain analogy and say that as hangs um, the hanging chain, serbit inverted, stands the masonry arch. What does it mean? If you get the voussoirs that you're going to use to, to form your masonry arch bridge, you hang them from a weightless chain or, or cable, you invert that, you then build your masonry arch, and you find that the the profile that you, you got before, when inverted, could fit entirely within the masonry, then that's uh, suggesting that the, uh, the shape of the arch satisfactory and your arch will stand successfully. So that's uh, a line of thrust. One issue, however, is that there are a multiplicity of lines of thrust because we're dealing with a statically indeterminate structure. And if we want to find a unique line of thrust. One way of doing that is to apply an eccentric load to the arch and to gradually increase it such that you have a profile or line of thrust which only just fits entirely within the masonry. And that's our limiting line of thrust. If we apply any more load, then hinges will form and we will get a collapse mechanism. So, key points, when you have a railway bridge in service, there are many possible lines of thrust, equilibrium states. You can use elastic theory to, to identify a single line of thrust, but it isn't necessarily the one that's actually uh, acting in practice. However, if the supports move, then typically we're transforming the structure into a statically indeterminate form. Then we can identify a unique line of thrust. And 
in actual fact in limit state ring we can do this very readily there's a mode um, called support movement mode where we can um, for example move the supports of a single span bridge outwards so we end up um, with a free hinge arch we can then um, apply loads and see how those hinges move around under the action of that service load. If we're interested in margin of safety, however, as I mentioned before, there's potentially a single limiting line of thrust or equilibrium state. And we can calculate the applied load or multiplier on some kind of vehicle loading required to cause collapse and with limit state ring this is the normal mode of operation where we have a vehicle and what we're trying to do is see uh, what multiplier applied to the vehicle loads will lead to collapse and that can give us uh, a good indication as to the margin of safety for the bridge um, question is how do we achieve that well if we go back to our previous um, previous model um, of all the permissible equilibrium states which are basically lines of thrust which fit inside the uh, the thickness of the the masonry what we can do is use optimization to find the one corresponding to the maximum load factor and that also corresponds to the point at which we get a mechanism of collapse. So in other words, we can use optimization to find the exact um, limit load for an assemblage of um, masonry blocks. In terms of uh, the mathematics, I won't go into this in, in detail, but typically we're multiplying some some load by a factor let's call it lambda so we're trying to maximize lambda subject to equilibrium so every block forming your masonry arch structure needs to be in equilibrium the forces acting on that block will be self-weight of the block and also forces transmitted through contacts so the block is talking to its neighbors through the contacts and so on this uh, diagram, there's a, a large block shown in blue with the forces from contact I highlighted as a normal force, a shear force, and a moment. And similarly, for the contact above the block, we would also have those three actions. And so what we can do is we can resolve the forces at the block centroid, for example, in the horizontal, vertical, and rotational sense, and verify um, that equilibrium is enforced at all times. We can also um, verify that sliding and um, hinging at contacts takes place as we would want. So, what we have in the, the yield circle or yield um, highlighted area is at the top, we have the constraint required um, to ensure that the effective line of thrust stays entirely within the masonry, i.e. that the hinge forms at the extremities of the um, thickness of the masonry. And the second constraint there is a sliding constraint, which is saying that the shear force must lie within lower and upper limits, where the lower limit is the coefficient of friction minus coefficient of friction times the normal force, the upper limit is the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So these very simple um, mathematical expressions completely define the problem, and fortunately for us, there are very efficient mathematical ways of finding rigorously the, the value of lambda um, that corresponds to the, um, the the structure at the point of collapse. This is really how the software works.
Um, in reality, we don't just have blocks in our masonry structure. If it's forming a bridge, we will inevitably have some kind of infill uh, required to allow a, a level road or rail surface. And what we do in the software is we model the anticipated effects of that infill. So what we actually do is we model spreading of the applied load. So we assume a spread angle and, and a, a distribution pattern. Uh, more detail on this in the, the previous webinar, which is, is available on our website for, for people who weren't able to make it to a to view. And also, when the arch sways into the surrounding infill, backfill material, we have backfill elements which provide passive restraint to that movement. And you can see in this uh, slide that we have backfill elements which uh, have been uh, mobilized, which is shown in, in blue, and backfill elements which have not been mobilized, which is shown in gray. So in other words, moving into soil leads to passive resistance. Moving away from the soil actually um, gives rise to no, no pressures. And what that's basically saying in soil mechanics terms is that we're neglecting active pressures because they're small, but we are modeling passive pressures because they're significant. But as I said, there's more detail on, on, on this issue in, in the previous webinar in the series. So just to um, pick out the elements of a bridge as modeled by limit state ring. What we have is a loading vehicle which is sitting on some track which is distributing the load down onto masonry blocks which are separated by contacts. When you um, put the model together if there is backfill, which there invariably will be, then we also have backfill elements. We can signal that we have very, very strong infill or backing. Um, and these are shown in a slightly darker shade of gray, just above the piers. So backing elements here. And what those uh, um, do is basically proper parts um, adjacent spans from each other. When we do the analysis, we find the critical um, failure load factor or adequacy factor, as we call now in limit state ring. And we also find the corresponding zone of thrust and pattern of hinges. So those are shown here in, in blue. And the thickness of those of the first zone um, indicates how much masonry of the um, compressive strength that's been specified is required in order to support that force. And then the hinges are shown in red. So that really sort of sums up the, the model. But obviously, we'll come on to actually uh, run some analyses using the software in, in, in a few minutes. Um, what distinguishes a railway masonry arch bridge from a highway railway, sorry, highway masonry arch bridge? The key thing is, is loading in limit state ring, partly because of its, uh, sort of pedigree, the fact that it was, uh, developed, um, through support from the railways. We, uh, incorporate track sleeper ballast distribution models and also we incorporate a range of standard loading vehicles for convenience although you can um, add very easily your own loading vehicles if you wish so what does this actually mean well if we look at uh, um, a length of of track then the traditional approach on the railways is to 
distribute load from an axle down onto an underlying sleeper and also onto adjacent sleepers. And the traditional approach is to say that a quarter of the, the load from an axle appears on the adjacent sleeper and half a load appear, um, is felt experienced by the sleeper directly under the axle. So that's basically how we model the, the track in limit state ring. And we can also specify um, distribution angles. So we can specify a distribution angle for load through the ballast, and we can specify a distribution angle um, for the underlying fill material as well. And those can be different. And I'm very aware that pretty much every um, code has a different suggested uh, distribution angle. And quite strangely, many codes have dist different distribution angle longitudinally and transversely, which uh, does appear slightly anomalous. The key thing is in the software, you can specify exactly what distribution angle um, is appropriate for your, for your case um, and is in line with the, the code of practice that you're working with. Um, so this is a transverse dispersal scenario. What you can do is um, allow the software to compute an effective width automatically using these distribution angles. And you can also um, cut off the effective width if, for example, you have longitudinal cracks in the arch barrel. And similarly, you may very well want to reduce the effective width depending on the, the overall extent of the bridge transversely. Clearly, you don't want an automatic effective width, which is wider than the actual width of the bridge. In terms of um, loading models, there are various built-in models. Um, the most common internationally is probably um, what was load model 71 from UIC. I think it's been incorporated into the Eureka now, but it's basically four 250 kilonewton axles with optional uniformly distributed load to each side. Normally for masonry arch bridges, um, having a uniformly distributed load is beneficial. So by default in the software, we don't include those elements. We simply include the, the four 250 kilonewton um, axles. Similarly, um, in particular regions, there are um, favoured loading models. So, for example, in the UK, there is a slightly uh, strange looking load loading model which has, uh, um, has, has its kind of roots in, uh, in the distant past. You know, I think it's a, a steam engine loading but it's, it's still used and so we've got uh, 200 kilonewton 150 kilonewton loading pattern and also a uniform distributed load which again we would ignore um, if we have a, a relatively short span structure then we also have um, the opportunity to use a short length version of this model which is likely to be uh, more critical In terms of um, um, how that software, how the software allows users to access that, we have something called a vehicle database, and we have um, in the vehicle library a series of uh, loading models. So, for example, you can see highlighted um, the um, RA1 type loading pattern that I showed before, but there are also um, other types of loading available and for example, at the bottom you can see is Indian railways loading vehicles are available. This is just a uh, a model 
of uh, showing how the learning from the RA1 pattern um, will be modeled using limit state ring, dispersing the load from each axle to adjacent sleepers, and you can see the net pressure uh, under underlying that uh, that vehicle, and the same for the short lengths. Um, in terms of the track and ballast, then there's the opportunity to enter basic prep properties, so the unit weight, the angle of dispersion. Um, you can enter um, details of the track load, spacing between sleepers, sleeper length, breadth, etc., uh, in order to uh, replicate the uh, situation that's uh, appropriate for the bridge that you're assessing. Um, another area which is um, um, there's, there's, there isn't yet agreement on in the in the railways community internationally is dynamic effects. Uh, however, the software is flexible, so you can you can enter a dynamic factor, and that factor can be applied to only one axle, which is common in the UK, or it can be applied to all for all axles, which is, is more common internationally. So basically, it's a partial factors dialogue, which we'll, we'll see later, which allows you to specify what that is, and then for a given vehicle, you can specify which axle or, or all axles, uh, if, if necessary, have that dynamic factor applied. Um, in terms of other loading effects, um, things like um, vertical effects of nosing or centrifugal effects don't change the pattern of loading, so you can either describe those um, pre pre analysis or actually you can um, take account of those retrospectively by modifying the final output that you get from the software. On the other hand, horizontal forces are not currently easy to model using the software. So traction and braking forces, um, there isn't simply isn't enough um, experimental and field data available to um, allow us to develop a uh, uh, a coherent um, a model of these for masonry arch bridges at the moment. Hopefully, that's something that will will change at some stage in the future. Um, just uh, move on to validation. Um, in terms of um, the sort of philosophy underlying the development of the limit state ring, we've been focused primarily on verifying the software against laboratory test the main reason being that we have very well characterized materials we know exactly what's in the bridge we know exactly what the construction details are so then we can have a an, um, a robust um, comparison problem with field bridge tests that have been carried out um, for example on the highways is very often um, tests are done in, in somewhat of a hurry, and many of the the key parameters are not actually uh, uh, identified, and so there's much uh, speculation as to what the appropriate parameters should be, which is is not ideal. Um, these are some of the the tests um, undertaken that led to the development of the very first version of Limit State Ring. The single span bridge in the background of the lower image was one of the British Rail research funded uh, bridges that I mentioned earlier. And in the foreground, we've got a multi span bridge and we've got a, a model um, showing that we could get a reasonable representation of um, the experimental outcome. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the validation that's been carried out for. Um, Highway bridges or bridges without track and ballast in this session, 
I think there's a bit more detail on this validation in the first webinar in the 2013-14 series. So you can you can refer to that if you're interested, uh, or um, send us an email and we'll we'll send you some uh, um, academic papers that will describe uh, the validation that was carried out. Um, more recently, there's been a focus on trying to understand how masonry elements interact with surrounding infill. So we have been undertaking tests at the University of Salford. Um, in this case, it's not very uh, clear, but we have a basically a, a load, and um, you can see how the soil is interacting with the masonry arch at collapse. In actual fact, we have a kind of a, a wedge of material, which is um, um, moving under, um, remote from the load, which is basically uh, our passive resistance um, in action, I guess, is one way of looking at it. Um, the very latest tests that we have been carried out at Salford have actually also included track and ballast. Been very, very uh, few tests, to my knowledge, carried out on masonry arch bridges with track and ballast. So this was a, a really nice opportunity to uh, have a look at this. Um, what we did is we um, we used ballast, 300 millimetres of ballast above the crown of the arch. This is a three metre span arch, 750 rise, 215 millimetres thick. We then um, had a, um, a rail acting on free sleepers. We applied the, the load from an actuator above the central sleeper and we basically low tested the structure to collapse. In terms of results, well, if we compare the results with track and sleepers, that's EP31 and EP33 with the comparable bridge with no ballast and sleepers, you can see that we have a significant uplift in load carrying capacity. So whereas we had 139 kilonewtons without, we have between 295 and 465 kilonewtons depending on the sleeper spacing. And just looking at the next column, that's got limit state ring analysis results. Um, if you simply transform the bridge to a railway bridge and use the default sleeper spacing, which is 500 millimeters, um, and other defaults, also using the as built geometry, because actually the geometry did, did, did was slightly different uh, between these, these two tests. But if we ignore that, then we get this value of 265 which is relatively close to EP33, but it's clearly uh, very conservative when we have that wider sleep spacing. So what it's telling us is that the probably the conventional quarter-half, quarter load spread model is somewhat conservative, um, but really we need to look into um, exactly how the uh, the arch, the fill, and the track ballast are interacting in more details before coming up with definitive um, conclusions. But from a pragmatic, practical perspective, um, we're getting a pretty uh, um, reasonable estimate um, of the uh, um, collapse load of this, of this, of this, of this bridge. Okay, if we move on to Look at some real world examples. Um, start with something very simple. This is a 3.28 meter span bridge. It's carrying a um, single track. Um, been quite happily 
um, carrying light passenger vehicles, but when um, coal wagons, coal trains start to pass over it, it starts to show signs of distress. So what I'm going to do is just start, let me state ring, and I think I've um, created a model of this, this, this structure. Um, probably I'll come back to this. I'll just, I'll just show you how, how you can create a new bridge before we move on to this one specifically. Um, if we choose the type of bridge in the first dialog, then that will trigger the introduction of, um, ballast sleepers, etc. And it will also give us access to the database of railway as opposed to highway vehicles. So what we're invited to do is to, um, first of all, enter details of the project, then details of the geometry. For now, I'll, um, in the interest of time, I'll keep things uh, simple. So let's say um, we have um, a span of five meters. Um, Mid-span rise will keep us the default. Perhaps have a larger ring thickness of 450. I won't model the abutments explicitly and I'll keep the um, the fill using the default values just for simplicity. We then come to the partial factors tab which I mentioned earlier. So if I want to um, include unit values for everything that's fine. If I want to follow codes of practice, then I can. So for example, in UK practice, it's quite common to have a, an axle load factor of 1.9 and a dynamic factor of 1.8. I can then specify the material properties. So I can specify the masonry properties, the unit weight, compressive strength, and also um, the coefficient of sliding friction. I can specify backfill properties, um, standard geotechnical properties, so unit weight, angle of friction, and cohesion. And also I can specify that I am going to model all the likely effects of the fill, so that's dispersed of live load and modeling passive pressures. Then move on to the track and ballast pane. So here we have the opportunity to enter the unit weight of the of the ballast, the um, angle of dispersion through the ballast, and also then details of the track. So typically track the track will exert some additional load onto the structure, which you can specify. Um, specify the spacing between sleepers, sleeper length, essentially the transfer distribution, the breadth. Uh, the height actually is simply for visualization purposes. Uh, I think you just say that. And then move on to the loading. And if I click on the vehicle database um, button, then I can get, um, for example, access to UIC load model 71, which I mentioned. Also, um, for example, um, load wagons or, um, for example, load train D4. I could use that. You can see that, that gives us um, defined axle loads and positions. So if I say OK to that, I can then change the, the vehicle on my bridge to be um, load train D4. I can click on this area and specify where my dynamic factor is applied. So if it was UK practice, I would choose one of these axles. If it was uh, more usual uh, international practice, then I would apply the dynamic factor to, to all axles. So there I have my, um, my arch with my, my load. I can 
move the, the load along the bridge uh, to manually investigate what the um, capacity of the bridge is. What I'm actually getting here in the output box is what's called an advocacy factor. This is basically the multiplier on the specified applied load. And basically, if it's greater than one, then it means that I've not got a problem. And if I want to do this manually, um, I can see actually that narrowly, it looks like um, I don't have a problem because the most critical point will be um, when the axles are over one half of the, the span. Okay, so that's, that's a demonstration of getting a, a bridge set up. If I go back to a particular problem that I was dealing with. This has got a, a more complex uh, geometry. Um, I believe it's, um, it's using survey points. So rather than using segmental geometry, it's actually got a series of XY points which define the shape. Um, and if I click solve, then I can see again that I get an advocacy factor. And again, I can move the the load across the, the bridge to explore what the likely uh, adequacy factor is. And in this case, with the particular effective width that I have, it appeared to be adequate. However, suppose that I find that when I look in at the, the photographs, I find that uh, um, there's, there's lots of mortar loss. Um, would that explain the fact that this bridge is showing signs of distress? What I can do is I can click on an individual contact and actually apply a mortar loss to it, or I can select all contacts and apply um, the mortar loss um, directly. So, for example, I could say there's a, a hundred millimeters mortar loss, do my analysis again, and hey presto, I find that I've got an advocacy factor which is much lower, in this case, below one. Clearly that might be a signal that we really need to get some maintenance on this bridge and um, 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 get, get those addressed if that was the real situation. Okay, um, I'll go back to the presentation. Um, let's move on to um, a slightly more complex structure. This is a, a five-span bridge um, that looks uh, very uh, neat and tidy after it's, uh, shortly after it's been constructed. This is a, an archive photo, but between it being constructed and the present day, there's been quite severe mining subsidence. I'm not sure uh, if you can if you can see the just the profile of the first span is distorted, and you can also see the uh, um, the parapet wall is clearly uh, highly deformed. So, for this example, um, we established a geometry from a laser scan survey. We know that we need this bridge to carry heavy freight traffic. Again, this is one in the UK. The kinds of questions that we need to have answers to are, is the deformed shape uh, a cause for concern? It looks pretty uh, severe. How does that influence the capacity? Also, does the type of loading vehicle affect capacity? So historically in the UK, uh, for carrying um, freight such as, as coal. We've moved from short wheelbase wagons to much longer wheelbase wagons, which uh, potentially could be problematic uh, um, for a bridge like this. So again, I'll start 
up the software. I think I've got um, um, got one with um, 156 um, load cases, so it just takes a few seconds to load up. What I'm going to do is move that load across the bridge. Um, it'll take a, a minute or so to, to actually do that, but what it's going to do is basically um, move that load all the way across the bridge from, from left to right, and I will get a capacity for each location, which I can then uh, look at in more detail. The way I've um, modeled the bridge is I've put backing above the, um, the piers and also above the abutments, and that's um, justified from justified by the original construction drawings, which are still available for this bridge, and also a modest amount of intrusive investigation. And then above that, in this case, we have um, conventional backfill material. Um, the um, any other issues to say? Yeah. So basically, we in this case we're using um, the network rail short length vehicle um, that's actually factored. It's got uh, a dynamic factor applied to one of these two axles, and uh, as I say, we're running that right across the bridge, and you can see in the output box. We're going through 100, look at 135, 6, and so forth. And next to the uh, description of the learning vehicle is the position. So we're going up in increments of 500 millimeters. And the next uh, column, you can't see the header now, it's, um, it's actually the effective width. And then finally is the outcome in terms of the adequacy factor. So actually, it's going up to be a very high value at the end. That's probably the, the vehicle um, going off the end of the bridge, in which case you can in, increase the, the load ad infinitum. Okay, so in terms of um, outcome, you can see the critical learning position is here. And we've got a... Um, an adequacy factor of 1.181. So that's saying that we can multiply up this this vehicle load by 1.18, and we'll get collapse. So if everything else is um, is correct, so all the assumptions about the backing, effective width, etc., are correct, then the indication are that this bridge has sufficient margin of safety. Um, for this particular case. However, if you remember, we said that particularly span one was highly distorted. I don't know if you can see um, clearly on the screen, but for example, the, the, the shape of the block at the crown, you can see is very quite strange looking, and that's as a result of the, the highly distorted geometry of that span. So the question is, um, how how did that influence things? Because we've got at the other end of the bridge, an equivalent span that hasn't been heavily distorted by mining subsidence. If we want to look at that, what we could do is we could, um, for example, plot the results in something like Excel. So if I just open Excel, find it. Paste that in. So what I've got then is the columns in the output box now appearing in columns in Excel. I don't need defective width, so I'll just uh, delete that column. And what I'll do is I'll just uh, just grab. I probably don't need to, to grab all these ones because the adequacy factor is getting very, very high. I'll grab up to there and I'll insert a 
chart and what we can see there very nicely I'm not lit not got the axles labeled yet but the the, the y-axis is the adequacy factor the x-axis is the positional on the bridge we can see how that the adequacy factor changes with position clearly when the load is over the piers the adequacy factor gets very high when it's over the spans it, it, it gets lower the interesting thing is when the the axles are over the first span which is not distorted actually the capacity is lower than when it's over that highly distorted span so actually the indications are that the distortion isn't a major cause of concern in this particular case it really depends on exactly how does those movements uh, mining substance movements manifest themselves in terms of uh, uh, the shape of the arch but in this case we appear to be uh, lucky another thing I could do is um, I've got another what another example but this time instead of the same bridge but now with um, different configuration of loading now we've got uh, railway uh, um, sorry coal wagons on here and actually you can see the adequacy factor is very very similar it's 1.19 for the critical case but quite interestingly we've got a, a failure mechanism which involves four adjacent spans so we can see that actually this bridge is working very very hard under the action of these uh, these kind of vehicles um, so what you'll find is is sometimes um you look, the adequacy factor under a particular learning pattern will actually have a major influence on on the outcome particularly when the the wheelbase of the vehicles in relation to the the spans of the arches uh, is in certain critical areas okay so let's go back to the uh presentation so questions does the form shape affect capacity well in this case apparently not greatly does the type of loading affect capacity now I didn't do a, a, a full analysis um, with all different combinations of dynamic factor on every different um, axle in this case in some cases actually you find it's marginally more critical to have the um, the real wagons than the the short length and in the case of other bridges as I mentioned earlier sometimes it's, it's very critical to, to model the real vehicles real wagons rather than notional ones um, just as a, a quick quick aside um, analysis sequence that um, seems to work very well is to do a death study establish the geometry so get good survey data then do some initial modeling studies to find out what the key uh, features are which appear to have an influence on the, on the outcomes of the uh, assessment and then um, if necessary carry out intrusive investigations prior to final modeling studies so moving on to conclusions um, limit state ring allows railway loading to be modeled very easily so including track ballast and, and load spreading um, one feature of the software is single and multi-span bridges can be modeled um, very easily if you if you have a multi-span model and a single span failure mechanism is critical then that will be identified you don't need to separately model single span single spans and multi spans the software will will use the rigorous um, mathematical optimization techniques to find the critical uh, loading um, position and the critical load factor and finally I, we haven't gone into it in much detail but many of the defects found in bridges and fields can be modeled in the software directly and that there's going to be global defects which is more to last pretty much uniformly throughout the introduction or it could be much more localized you could have just an area uh, 
of more to loss that you can model using software as well. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the um, main part of the webinar. Uh, time for questions. So please fire away with questions. Okay. So I've got a number of questions. Um, so what material properties of masonry is required to input into the program? I think I've um, I, I covered that uh, after this question was posed. So uh, basically, unit weight and the compressive strength. Um, how to incorporate condition of masonry bridge into the program, then basically what we're trying to do is model as many defects as we can directly, such as is, is mortal loss or, for example, open open hinges you can you can model in the software using the mortal loss feature. Um, seismic load capability, we don't have that capability. Um, did mention that uh, limit state geo can be used to model masonry bridges. That does have that capability, uh, although it is more time consuming to set up a masonry bridge in that software than it is in the limit state ring. Um, I think the other questions by the asker are already been covered in the webinar. Um, Multi-ring brick arches, what should the coefficient between blocks be set to? Um, this is a difficult question. Um, in general, um, this, the output is not very sensitive to what you put in there as long as it's in, 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 a, in a reasonable range. A reasonable range coefficient of friction are you know, 0.5 to 0.6. Um, sometimes you'll find that the, the mortar between rings has become uh, very degraded and, it, and it's basically just you know, sort of soft, not even, not even necessarily sand, it's, it's sort of, you know, almost um, cohesive in nature. And in those cases, if you've got concerns, you can obviously put in the lower coefficient of frictions. Uh, question, can you model more than one track over the arches? Uh, the answer is um, um, yes and no. You, can, you don't, can't do that in the software directly, but it's, it's, it's easy to um, use an effective whip to, to model the effects of double track or how many tracks that you have. Uh, will this webinar be available online for further study? Yes, it will be available, I think, within the next uh, 24 hours. Um, and I think every, everybody will get a uh, an email with a link to it so you can peruse it or share it with your colleagues if you wish. Um, how do we incorporate the crush masonry in a localised manner? Um, in the same way as um, you can locally model um, mortar loss, you can also locally um, specify um, a, a reduced crushing strength. So, for example, if we have mushy, mushy bricks in this region, we could reduce that from five to, say, two. And then, basically, when we solve, we, we, we may get a slightly reduced Actually, it's not in a critical place, so it made no difference. Um, if I move it down to here, then we'll get a very slight difference, probably in the. Um, just need to. Number of questions. Um, clay level is present. What coefficient of friction at the interface of the arch barrel and the fill? Good question. It's not something that we've um, we've looked at. It's something again that would be it'd be easier to do with limit state geo. So it might be something an interesting study for us to to look at. That is quite common to find a uh, a thin layer of clay to provide waterproofing. Um, the answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> 
Um, examples showed circular arches. There are arches that are elliptical and skewed. Can this be analysed? Um, yes, you can put in um, a variety of different shapes. So, um, so one of the options include um, pointed, free centred, um, but also click here ones are um, interpolated where you can actually just put a series of points and then you can get pretty much any shape there. Um, skew arches, it's a two dimensional software program, so at the moment um, you can only model the anticipated effects of the skew. Assessment codes generally provide advice on that. Um, not, not ideal, but uh, um, a pragmatic approach, I guess. Um, I think we're probably running out of time. So if there are other questions, a number of other questions that I haven't got around to answering, uh, but we'll answer those by, by email. So I'll just hand you back now to, uh, to Tom to just wrap up. Okay, thanks, Matthew, and thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, as Matthew hinted that we're now near the end of the webinar, and hope you found it informative and learned some useful things. For people who are current users of Limit State Ring, um, we hope you learned something new about the software that maybe you didn't already know. Um, and if the webinar has prompted any questions, like Matthew says, please do get in touch with us via info at limitstate.com or on the telephone, and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. For those of you who aren't current users of the software, we'll be in touch over the next few days just to get some feedback, find out if you have any further questions, and see whether you think Limit State Ring might be useful to you. Um, if you'd like to watch the webinar again, or maybe you know somebody who might be interested to watch it, then there will be a recording available hopefully later today, and we will send you an email out with a link to it once it's available online. Uh, finally, please do look out for the event notifications that will be sent out by email and also posted on our website at www.limitstate.com slash events. Um, and these will tell you about upcoming webinars, either to do with Limit State Ring or with Limit State Geo. So finally, I'd like to say thank you all for listening and hope that you can join us again in the near future. Goodbye.